Good morning, everyone. Salam alaikum. How are we? You're looking a little bit sleepy. I need a bigger salam back than that. Salam alaikum. Thank you. That's better. My name is Yasmin Khan. I'm your MC for today. Um, welcome to Monka Fest. Um, can I get a show of hands? Who here is an artist of some description or other? Great. Shout out what you are. Filmmakers? Poets? Poets. Po poetry. Look, the poets are straight in there. Come on. Filmmakers, you're too quiet. Where are the filmmakers? They're shy, okay. Um, well, this session this morning is trans transformative arts, promoting a positive image. Um, how do we develop arts and literature as a powerful tool to, to promote a positive image? And uh, there's going to be a Q&A later, but my question in there, first of all, would be, do we need art to promote a positive image? So let's uh, kick off with that thought. Now, our speaker this morning is Zeba Rahman. She is, has led the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art in the US. That's what she currently does. But prior to that, she's been a creative director and producer for 20 years, so I'm guessing she knows quite a lot about the arts. <laughs> uh, she will be doing the Q&A very shortly with the singer Sheila Majeed, but first of all, let's introduce Zebra onto stage. Zebra Rahman. Thank you. for more than 20 years of uh, uh, a whole range of performing arts, including music and dance, um, theater. I've also produced film and, um, and also worked with literature. And my primary interest in culture is to combine it with the most pressing issues of the day and to galvanize us into thinking about the issues and to um, acting. So, arts and action is where I stand. And um, I'm going to show you some video clips in a little bit, but to our topic, transforming arts and promoting a positive image, particularly for those of us who are from the Muslim world, uh, is something that, that um, is uh, a priority for me. I, I became interested in this topic when, uh, in the 90s, I really felt the world was pulling apart, you know. Um, the Western world and the Muslim world, there were tensions on both sides, and I was thinking, what could I do as somebody who's uh, from the world of culture, who's not an engineer or a doctor, how can I make a difference? And I thought, well, the arts has the most primary ability to move us, to make us reflect. It allows us to uh, become provoked. I mean, art can be very provocative because as many of you are artists, you know that artists are also social commentators. You're constantly passing what's in the world around you and expressing that in some way um, through your art. You know, it's, um, um, and it's terrific to see how you do that creatively, but you serve a very important purpose. So I thought, all right, I'm going to combine these two and uh, try to do something. And I didn't actually have a map, you know. Um, I, I didn't come with a, a plan, but I thought there was a way to do it. And one of the ways I, I did it was to, uh, during the embargo against Iran in the 90s, um, work with an organization I was involved with, I was chairing, called World Music Institute in New York. And we did a festival uh, of Muslim culture. And at that point, we couldn't even get the artists into the US, particularly the Iranian artists, because there was a embargo, as I said. So it was very difficult to do, but it really strengthened my resolve to do it, do more of this kind of work. And so I then joined uh, a festival in Morocco named the Fez Festival of World Sacred Music. You're not in your head, you know about it. Um, many of them may not, but it was a festival that was founded after the first Gulf War and the invasion of Kuwait in the early 90s because the founder, who is an anthropologist by training and a Sufi, felt very strongly that music, particularly sacred music, had a place in bringing people together 
and to affirm or reaffirm the bonds between peoples. Um, and therefore, in FEST, uh, he launched the FEST Festival of World Sacred Music in 1994. I joined him in 1997. Um, as the U.S. representative, and then my role expanded. I, I went on to, to get two little spits of land uh, under my purview, Asia and North America. And so I became responsible for really, um, I think um, the word is really um, transferring the spirit of Fez and the festival to people in Asia and North America and to draw them to Fez and also to take FEDS and the, the festivals programs out into um, to those two parts of the world. So it's an ongoing association, it's my longest running commitment, and uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a video clip, but before I do that, I want to tell you about um, a, um, a mad scramble that I did in 2010 to create the New York Sufi Music Festival after there was an unfortunate incident where a um, Pakistani-American named Faisal Shahzad um, attempted to bomb Times Square in New York City and um, people's perceptions of Pakistanis, in, in, uh, America particularly, and around the world, Pakistanis and Muslims in general was at an all-time low. It was at the same time that um, <clears throat> Uh, a group of uh, Muslim Americans were trying to uh, launch a cultural center near Ground Zero, and there was a lot of pushback from um, the extremists on the right, and I'm talking actually now about uh, the, the Americans. Um, and so in the heat of this, I and a friend got together with the Pakistani ambassador to the UN, and we uh, brought about four dozen Sufi musicians from Pakistan to New York, uh, put them on the street, one of the busiest streets in New York, um, in Union Square. And at 5 p.m., we launched the New York City Music Festival, and it was anchored um, by a wonderful music, um, musician, singer named Abda Parveen, who's um, uh, just amazing, and she's, she's uh, really a giant in the field of Sufi music. So I'm going to ask Steve to actually play that clip, that first clip. And this is um, what happened. We um, launched it within six weeks. the Rubin Museum of Art and Asian Society, and uh, it was very successful. But um, the most important thing for me personally was what it did to transform um, the feeling amongst Muslims, and particularly South Asian Muslims. I um, received myself texts and calls and uh, Facebook messages and, and Twitter, you know, on Twitter. Just one word, which was P-R-I-D-E. I mean, people just felt so proud of their heritage. And it just convinced me that this is, this is the route to continue to, to apply. Um, and Steve, thank you very much. I just wanted to give a taste of, of what that was like. Um, we also, uh, our media, our communications company said that we had mm, between 50 to 100 million uh, media impressions, which is very high. And um, that happened because a lot of the um, blogs and um, video, video pieces um, went viral. And so in terms of actually reaching the rest of the world for this effort, it became, um, it became huge. And we were asked to uh, take it to other cities. At the same time, by the way, in Pakistan, um, important Sufi shrines were being attacked. So um, we felt that it was something very important to do, and I hope to continue to do it in the future. Um, so now, this is, is uh, where I, I continued on, and that was in 2010. I also wanted to show you a clip from the Fez Festival. 
Uh, how many of you know about the Fez Festival? A couple, a few of you. Um, it's really become one of the um, one of the more important projects coming out of the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, because of its intention. Um, this uh, terrific word that we have, niat, or niya. By the way, if that word is the same word that is in Hebrew, and it's a word that uh, the Jewish community uses. I think they pronounce it naya, but it's the same word, and I think that's very interesting that we have so many languages, you know, so, so much common ground between us. Um, it would be great to find our way back to each other in some way. Um, so the um, first festival of world sacred music, which has been going now for 19 years, we'll celebrate our 20th anniversary next June, is an annual event, and it is under the patronage of the key, um, which means that it allows us to um, actually use that as our calling card when we're going up to sponsors, and this is something that, uh, as you know, we're at the economic farm here. Uh, economics is very important. So uh, it's, uh, it uh, brings together over nine days um, hundreds of artists from around the world, and we're structured in this way. We have the ticketed festival, for which people have to pay, we have the free festival in the city, and we have the Fez Forum, which is where the most uh, important topics of the day are discussed, and it brings together at the Forum uh, heads of state and grassroots activists, um, spiritual leaders, um, young people who are doing interesting work and inspiring work, artists, and uh, it's very informal. It's held under um, centuries old Barbary oak tree in, uh, in a garden, in an Andalusian garden inside um, the Batha Museum. So it's uh, become a very important farm as well, in, and uh, it runs a lot within the frame of the Fez Festival, so we combine both the discursive and the artistic together, and that makes a very, very powerful platform. Um, now we attract about 500,000, about half a million people over the course of nine days to the festival. Mind you, that um, includes people who come to the, the festival in the city, the free festival. So the, the largest number of people that come to the festival are those who attend the free festival in the main market square. And here's a clip uh, from the Fest Festival. The 10 day festival featured inspiring performances by various artists, including the renowned Senegalese superstar Yassine Nadour, who performed at the historic Baba Makina, attracting a crowd of over 3,000 spectators. Prior to the concert, Mr. Nadour talked to reporters about the February 20th movement a youth-led network of reform-seeking demonstrators who called for more transparent government in Morocco. In May, the King appointed an advisory committee whose main aim will be to draw proposals for the constitutional reform by June. Mr. Nadur praised King Mohammed, saying his response to the demand for change had been wise. King have a vision, what I think he have a vision, he's young, he have a vision, he anticipate. Uh, to govern people, you have to anticipate a uh, feel uh, what's happened in February uh, about, you know, ideas to open uh, more in the democracy. Catherine Marshall, an American developer in charge of organizing the Fest Festival, told the Arabia of Morocco's position and its relation to the chain of Arab uprising. Uh, there is a sense that Morocco is quite distinctive, that it is different, uh, that Morocco uh, is more stable and is more likely to see an evolutionary path as opposed to a revolutionary path. However, Ms. Marshall also cautioned of possible risks that come with adoption of this strategy. But there is also, I think, a very clear awareness which we sense both in the questions and in the discussions inside and outside the formal discussions of the forum that this is a challenging time, a critical moment. Uh, and that Morocco has a real opportunity uh, to move in a very positive direction, but that the risks are, su are substantial. Currently, Morocco is one of the only Arab countries that remain unaffected by violent clashes and civil protests. How far this will continue depends largely on the policies that its government pursues. Nadia Dismayan, Arab.
Jazz Festival really has had um, a substantial impact on Moroccans. Um, it's not true that there haven't been protests, there have been protests, but they have been managed um, with wisdom, I think the king has, and I think that some of you may have heard Mr. Ben Kiran um, at the opening yesterday speak about the role of the king in amending the constitution um, in response to the demand that the protesters uh, had made for greater, greater reform and uh, freedom. So it's a work in pro uh, progress in Morocco. However, um, the festival has played an important role, and I'll tell you how. Um, I remember specifically in the late 90s saying to the director, Fozi Scali, um, that it would be great to expand beyond showcasing um, musicians from the three Abrahamic faiths, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And, he's, uh, and I, I wanted to bring a Tibetan singer, Yang Chen Lama, to the festival. And he said, Seba, we really have to open the door slowly. Our population here, and many in the Muslim world, are not as yet used to uh, listening to music. There, there are varying levels of practice, um, you know, and, and it, it goes the full gamut, and some people are very conservative and as yet uncomfortable with music, having a music festival. So we need to be careful. And I think there will be a moment for Yang Chen, but not in the foreseeable future, in the near future. And I, uh, you know, in my, my American self felt, it's not, not right, and we need to open up, and we need to do this. But he was so wise, because in fact, um, I did see that. I did see the reactions to music, and you know, we did have to be careful. And, and over the years, we built enough trust, and um, it, it, in our audience, um, particularly from Morocco and the region. And in a few years, I would say in the early 2000s, Yang Chen came and she performed, and she was the highlight of the first festival with her beautiful uh, voice, and she really carried carried a great moment. Um, and people remember her to this day. So uh, that's one thing I find in, with the Fez Festival, with the management of the festival, and with Morocco's position in the world. Um, right now, they, they have been treading slowly, but deliberately, and uh, it has had a positive impact. So, that's the FES Festival, and I'm, I'm just uh, reaffirming that, that um, the topic of our day, which is uh, promoting a positive image through the arts, is possible. Um, the next thing, I'm going to show you another clip um, from a project that I did in New York with uh, an organization called BAM, Brooklyn Academy of Music. Pakistani artists have been representing Pakistan in several regions are performing in well, the Well, right, that's right. Um, this is actually um, another clip. This is um, a, a continuation of the, um, of the coverage for the New York Sufi Music Festival. And what's interesting about this clip, um, which you can skip over, um, is uh, from NDTV. NDTV is one of the biggest uh, television um, stations in India. And they actually came to cover this event that was focused on Pakistan. And so people in India learned about the effort. And uh, again, it reinforced, um, you know, with yet another population, and often, often uh, a population that's at loggerheads with Pakistan and um, Muslims, that there was something positive going on. Do you think we can we can have the clip after this one? Yep, terrific. So this is uh, I think the clip we're going to show is is uh, Bam. It's revolutionary rappers. Um, well, Steve is sorting that out. Um, okay, here we are. I'll let you watch it and then I'll tell you a little bit about it. <laughs> Things that I saw in society that I didn't accept, I didn't like. <clears throat> so that was that was what was I was trying to communicate in my music. Right now, it's, it's basically a state of disappointment, and that's that's the theme of what I'm trying to work out right now. My new music is like disappointed me because we expected after revolution things would go well, right? But you know, people realize it's going to take some time. <laughs> And the 
saw the oppression and the wrongdoing of the government, I decided to write this song. The lyrics came straight from my heart, and it was released on the 23rd anniversary of the rule of Ben Ali in Tunisia. There were no people talking at the time, no one was allowed to express his opinion. That's why I felt this message should be explicit and direct to the president. <laughs> I wrote this song in 2011, eight months before the coup d'etat in Mali. Everybody could feel that something would happen, but not, but not when and what exactly. So I was talking about that to the government, to the politics, and to uh, the other Malians to talk about this situation, to talk about this frustration, and try to find together solutions. <laughs> The situation is more difficult. I have greater responsibility now. Before, the only person targeted was the president. Now we have different political affiliations. So it's harder for me to deliver a message to the people. The extremists and Islamists are not uh, powerful enough for the moment to make rappers stop talking. So we will keep on talking even if they are not happy about that. If they are not uh, afraid to try to destroy our country, I can't be afraid to talk. watching the U.S. hip hop scene very closely and we're inspired by it. And I think also the U.S. hip hop scene got inspired by us too, in a way um, because it reminded them of the good old days when hip hop was all about, you know, conscious messages, uh, change, and, you know, talking about real things. Thank you, Brooklyn. This, um, as you may have surmised, this uh, project was um, centered around bringing together uh, conscious rappers from the Middle East and North Africa, and they included El General from Tunisia, who is credited with really inspiring protesters in, in, um, during the Jasmine Revolution because he had uh, an underground track that he released before um, the uh, Bouazizi uh, emoliated himself called Reis La Bled, which is a very, very direct, very strong criticism of Ben Ali. And uh, he, challenged, he challenged Ben Ali at that point. And so the protesters grabbed his song as soon as the revolution began and started chanting it and, and uh, used it over and over again. And he was actually... Um, grabbed by, by the street police and, and uh, worked over a bit and uh, finally got released because the protesters actually demanded his release. So there's great power in, um, in being part of a movement. And uh, the others were um, Muhammad al from, from uh, Cairo, um, who uh, has several songs that they used as protesters pouring into Tahrir Square and they actually used his lyrics to um, give each other courage and inspire others to join the movement. Uh, it also included Shadia Mansour, who you didn't see in this BBC clip, who is Palestinian and grew up in London, you, you may know of her. Um, and she's been uh, um, a political artist, very, very active in um, speaking out uh, through her music about the situation with her people in Palestine. And Ankulen from Mali, who had the song SOS, which he actually 
um, um, you know, launched before the, um, <coughs> the attack in Northern Mali. So my motivation was to bring them together and actually introduce them to American audiences who didn't really know very much about them, and um, to share, have them share their message um, with uh, the BAM audience in the Opera House. It has um, about 2,000 seats, and we were sold out, and we um, had a very, very positive uh, impact on the audience. Uh, you may have seen that some of them were, you know, right there, you know, um, with, with the artists, even though they didn't really understand the words. And this is the power of music and culture, that it can flow over boundaries, it can move beyond words, because it connects us directly, you know, emotionally, through our hearts. And in that opening, in that moment, um, we can be transformed. It's, it's quite amazing what the power of um, uh, art is in this way. And I really do believe that it fits within the larger frameworks, the political and economic frameworks. Um, I think that artists can be first responders very often in emergency, emergency situations. Um, in many ways, as, as these rappers have. They've been right there with um, the revolts and with the people. So I'm going to stop here because we have a very special guest who's going to join us. But um, this has been my life's work and I intend to continue doing it even though I've now just moved over into the world of philanthropy. I will continue to do my creative work because I strongly believe that the arts have the power in a way that goes beyond talk, beyond um, the kind of violent um, attacks, and, and has the capacity to transform us all. And uh, so I'm going to bash on with that. And now, with this, I'm going to, to ask uh, the lovely Sheila Majid to join us. Uh, Sheila, of course, needs no introduction. I, I think um, for those of you in the room who don't know her, she's, she's uh, really a giant in Malaysia. Um, despite her frame, she, she reaches far and wide. Uh, she's got an absolutely lovely voice and, and has what I think is most essential to artists, which is that she's a great communicator and she has the capacity to connect with her audience and the people. Thank you, Zeba. I believe small thing, uh, the best things in life comes in small packages. <laughs> you know, when you receive a present and it is in a small box, you know that's valuable. <laughs> anyway, um, I'd like to thank uh, MochaFest for inviting me here today, this morning. And I think we have a very interesting um, subject today, transforming you know, arts you know, in a positive image. I do agree with Zeba in the sense that um, the messages that we send across, I mean, Music is universal to me, in my opinion. It brings people together, transcends all age barriers, racial backgrounds, or even religion. It's like sports, yeah? You don't ask whether you're, what religion are you or what race are you. If you like the artist and you like the genre of music, it brings you together, yeah? And as an artist, uh, in my opinion, um, I try and lead by example. You know, today I see, um, you know, as much as we have progress and as much as we have, um, uh, we call ourselves highly educated, but we have forgotten the finer values in life that all race and religion has taught us. We have become aggressive, we have become selfish. And you know, Islam is not aggressive. Islam is not violent. So, by... You're doing music, like for example, the lyrics in music is very important. I think the choice of words is very important. Meaning like, yeah, you can show angst, but maybe instead of saying, shut up, you can say, be quiet. I have four children, so I try and, you know, live that, you know, instead of telling them, hey, get out. Can you please leave? So, so when they grow up, they don't have this habit of saying, shut up and get out. And I see that in my children today, when they are fighting with each other, they'll just say, be quiet. 
I'm like, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> you know, so these are the things that we need to infuse in our youth, especially when music is concerned. It is the youth. The big market is the youth, right? And to me, you know, when people say music is bad, music alone is not bad. It is how the artists project themselves that is important. Yeah? And being Asian as I am, and being a Muslim as I am, I'm very conscious of whenever I perform or whatever lyrics that I write, it must send a message that people can either reflect on or relate to. Because to me, music is art and it's supposed to touch your emotion. You know sometimes when you watch a movie and there's no dialogue, there's no actor, it's just a car going over a bridge. But when you hear the soundtrack, it can bring tears into your eyes. So that is what music is all about. It's an art that's supposed to touch your emotion. And today I see, I mean, I mean, maybe I'm just old school. Yeah, I like those type of lyrics because my 22-year-old daughter was listening to this song, I mean, excuse my language, and the whole way the singer was going ass, 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 ass. And I'm like, what is that? That's hardly art, you know? <laughs> Right? So, and, and, and all over the world, they're trying to add, yeah, I mean, you know, with sex and all that kind of stuff in music, but I'm totally against that. Yeah? yeah? Uh, so, um, so that's where I'm coming from, and as an artist, yeah? I, 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 start, I mean, you see, but I was telling her, I'm not a monologue person, you got to feed me with a question, but listen to me, I'm rattling away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean... Delightful. Um, one question that I have for you sure. is, um, do you remember a, a particular breakthrough moment where that you were in a situation with an audience or with some people and you were singing and you found a very direct connection with them? And do you remember what happened? I'm sure um, you have several, but if you can think of one that really uh, affected you. There was one time when um, I wrote... My, for the very first time, I wrote lyrics to this particular song. I was going through a tough time, and it was all about asking God, Allah, to give me the strength and the hope to carry on with my life. And uh, I didn't want it to sound too, uh, how shall I put it, because I'm doing pop, pop with elements of jazz mu music, and I didn't want it to sound too nashid-like, you know, yeah? Because I'm singing to the youth, and you know what the youth are like. When they hear that, they're like, oh God, you know? So. I had to pick the right choice of words to make them realize. And when I, was, when I sang that for the very first time, it actually touched a lot of people's hearts, even the non-Muslims. And they came up to me and they said, I love your God song. <laughs> but actually the song, the title is Kumohon, which means hope. And that alone, sort of, and I was singing in, in Malay. Well, all my music is in Malay. You know, but it can actually touch the emotion of anyone who's listening to it. That's why it's very powerful. And then they begin to want to know what the lyrics are all about. And what were the lyrics? It's, um, oh God, you know, oh Tuhan, tenangkan hati jimmy calmness, dalam sanubariku in my, in my soul, untuk menempuhi segala hidup penuh cabaran ini. It's to go on with my life that has a lot of um, challenges. Oh Tuhan, ku berserah segalanya kepadamu. I submit to you. I, oh, oh God, you know, I, I, I decide, I mean, you decide for me. So long as my life, agar, my soul is tenang, jiwa ku tenang, I come with your guidance. Dengan bimbinganmu selalu. So this is something, you know, with your guidance all the time. So this is something that everybody can reflect on. I mean, can relate to, regardless of race or religion. Yeah. Absolutely, it has universal appeal. Exactly, Which yeah. Is, so it's not a surprise that you got the reactions you've got. Yes, and you know what saddens me is when people try to politicize music. That saddens me. I mean, you know, like, to me, it's like music is music. Send good messages across. It doesn't have to be, I mean, when you see a football team, you don't say that's Muslim, a uh, Muslim team. Yeah? So same thing with music. It's like, just not politicizing. 
let's just enjoy it because it brings people together. Yeah? Yeah. You know, when did you become interested in actually using music to um, send a message? Um, okay, this is, this is something really interesting because um, I, got into, I got into singing by accident. I love music and I love singing from a very young age. But my father is an academic man. He graduated in Oxford. All right, so I, being the youngest in the family, and a girl, of course he freaked when I said I wanted to be a singer. Huh? So he said, no, maybe as a hobby, not as a career. But I so had to strategize it, you know, in such a way where after sitting for my own levels, I was waiting for my results and I had nothing to do. Before that, I was already approached by people from the, from the music industry to ask me whether I I'd like to do an album, and I'm like, oh, I would love to, but how? So while waiting for my O-Levels results, I approached my father, and I said, why don't you let me try do this? I'm not doing anything anyway. And he was like, all right, you know? So, so then I cut my first album, which was just for fun. It was by a local label. And alhamdulillah, it got good response, because I was doing something different at that time. You know, it was not the traditional pop Malay songs or at that time the, the, the in thing was doing rock, you know. I was doing something else and it actually created my fan base. And, and after that, an international label noticed me and then they came in and bought over the contract. And then the rest is history. And I'm so glad to say when my father passed away in 1996, he had followed me through all my tours and he was quite happy and confident that yes, uh, this is my niche, you know. I'm, I'm not an academic person, I'm more an artistic person, which he never really understood. But he could see I could make a living out of it. What do you think we can, we can say to our audience here about ways in which each one of us can help to promote a positive image? Uh, whatever our artistic medium, like the message, of course. But what consciously, consciously can we do to uh, move the needle forward uh, beyond what we're doing now? Is there anything that comes to your mind from, from your experience? I think as an artist, yeah, uh, my point of view is we have to lead by example. Don't do the things, because we have fans, we have followers who want to emulate what we do. So we have to be careful on how we bring ourselves in, pu in, in public, you know, and when we do interviews, whatever we say, you know, because the fans will want to do what you want to do. So if you deliver messages to them which is positive, inshallah, you know, they want to be, I want to be like her. Yeah. Terrific thing to do, lead by example. Uh, we're going to open up um, to the floor. If you have any questions, feel free to ask us. Not a single hand. Oh, no. uh, okay. I'll start with one. Um, so, uh, for my part, I do a combination of broadcasting, theatre making, all, all sorts of writing. And I constantly get asked about, um, oh, the things that you're writing about. Is this how the Muslim community is? And do you have a responsibility to represent everyone? And sometimes, I'm sure a lot of people feel the same, that you feel the weight of responsibility on your shoulders, particularly at the moment, with the spotlight on you. But is there a time when that balance can tip the wrong way for you as an artist, when you think, actually, I just want to write about what I want to write about? It may be that it's one song or it's one character in a play that some aspects of which are not pleasant about the community, but it doesn't represent everyone. It's just something as an artist you want to say. Um, how do you feel about that sort of tipping point? <coughs> that makes well, sense. I, I, can't really, um, I, I haven't come across that, you see. But um, I guess you can't please the whole world. But the thing is, like I said, you, when you write a book, it is your opinion. And therefore, when somebody comes in, this is the Muslim world's opinion, I, I think that just you should tell them, like, hey, this is my opinion. This is what I want to do. And this is my expression. It doesn't put it into a, like, this is how the whole Muslim community sees it. What, what, what about when you guys write a book? We don't think that that's the way the whole, your whole community thinks. We just read it and then, you know, we decide. 
you know, whatever that's in there, whether we are agreeable to that or not. Yeah? I, that's how I feel. Yeah. This is a constant problem now because we're, the, we're so, uh, we're under microscope in a way, and each one of us is uh, viewed as representing our people, you know, um, whereas we're just people. Yes, we're just people, ourselves. exactly. You know, it's, I, I find that just because some, something happens and the person that does it is a Muslim, it becomes a Muslim world problem. And yet, when someone else does it and they're not Muslim, it becomes a general problem. You know? Yeah. It won't always be like this. I hope. So, therefore, we have to lead by example. We have to show people that we do not agree with the violence and the aggressiveness that's being shown. These are not what our teachings are. We are peaceful people. We are taught to be tolerant. We are taught to have good manners. Yes, that's what's, that's what's missing today. Good manners. And you don't have to be... Muslim or any other, you know, uh, it, it's just a human behavior. And I think, like I said just now, we have forgotten the final values of life that all religion and race has taught us. Which, I think we need to take a step back and look into that. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, she actually uh, touched on a very important uh, point, which is that our heritage and the Muslim gives us a set of values from which we can, from that foundation, we can actually move forward and express ourselves. Um, and the other thing, to your point, um, and to Sheila's, is that, that in the heat of the moment, since we are in the hot seat, one of the things, one of the good things that comes out of that is that it helps us to really crystallize our, our own ideas, our, our own positions about um, the world around us and where we stand in that. So that's useful and I think we really could use that to um, our advantage and to the advantage of, of building bridges between us and, and those who, who are interested to know more about us and who are a bit afraid uh, of the M word, you know, when it comes to capital M. <laughs> it's so self-conscious right now. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, morning. Uh, uh, Shila, my name is Jamal. I'm a Mocha artist. Um, I'm a Malaysian, so yeah, you have got a big fan here. Thank uh, you. <laughs> you have good taste. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Um, there's a saying in Malaysia, it's, it goes, kuchil kuchil, uh, chipadi, means, um, well, we eat a lot of chili. So it's a little small chili, yeah. which so, kills you. Yeah. <laughs> so so just, just to echo her sentiment on the fact that great things come in small packages. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm a poet. I write a lot about things, and I, the things that I write represent people, represent stances, opinions, perspectives, so on and so forth, right? So, since I was a big fan, um, I always listen to a lot of your stuff from my cousin's collection. He has your entire collection. You don't have series. my collection. <laughs> <laughs> he is 20 years older than I am. Oh. <laughs> okay, so... I shall not entertain your question. <laughs> no, I'll just okay. Okay. Um, yeah, You might have known him because you gave him a necklace for when, when he did your Shila Majid. Oh, I gave sponsor. you my necklace, I did? Yeah, yeah. With my me. husband's here, you know. <laughs> it's a nice wish for your number one fan or something. Anyway, my question is, uh, borrowing, his, borrowing your albums from him and reading through your lyrics, which were very well written, regardless of who your producer was, it is very consistent and it is, it, one cannot be helped but to feel that they are genuine. It comes from the heart. Yes. yes. So now I want to ask you a question because I believe for anybody doing arts, this is the most important thing. Regardless if you make money or not, what do you write or perform or sing for? What do I write, perform and sing for? Yeah, because I believe that is the one thing that sets you apart from many other successful Malaysian artists because you connect. Oh, okay. Um, and, and, and it's all about values, like what you said. Yeah. So, so. My inspiration actually is about the surroundings around me, from what I see, you know, the environment, how people behave. And like Kumohon, the song about God is more about how I feel. And most of the time when I'm given songs or lyrics, I would vet through it, and if, it, if I don't feel for it, then I'm not going to perform it. 
So I think it's very important to feel for that because and because when you perform, that transcends to the audience, that vibe, that energy. And that's very important because it touches you there. That's what art is all about to me. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I actually have a question. The, you sang two songs last night um, for those of us who were there. And um, tell us a little bit about how you chose those two songs and what the themes were. Oh, okay. The first one is called Legenda. Legenda is dedicated to uh, one of Malaysia's um, geniuses in, in, in the performing arts. His name is Tan Sri Pirami. I have been a big fan of his work and um, at that time I find that people were more into his films because he does films and music but when it comes to the singing part people just fast forward the video and I thought that would be a shame because he writes beautiful melodies and if people are just going to forget about his songs and that's, that's our heritage so the youth didn't want to hear his music anymore at that time because production was you know in the 50s and, and this was what, 90s? There was, you know, the, the quality of, of the production wasn't on par with what was currently going. So I thought I wanted to bring, I chose some of my favorites of his songs and reproduced it so that it would be more, um, how shall I say it, more uh, contemporary. Thank you very much. And um, there was one song which we, we did, which is Legenda, that was dedicated to him, you know? And Sinaran was my first hit, the, the second song. Sinaran is 28 years old, by the way. Yeah, don't ask me what, when I started. Just remember I was a child star. <laughs> Five years old, I'm gonna like Anyway, so that song actually brought me to the other region, the other countries, Singapore, Indonesia, Brunei, even Japan, actually. So that's that's my that's the all-time favorite. Till today, I think I've sang it for the hundred millionth time. <laughs> and whenever I perform, I will always ask the client, "Do you do I have to do sinaran?" And they said, "But of course, you know, because <laughs> well, as a performer, I feel like just just like if you were to watch Whitney Houston and she doesn't sing, I will always love you. You'll be like, damn, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever it is, I have to sing sinaran. So that's my. My signature, it's your my signature. signature song. Yes. So those are the two songs. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions? All right. Um, thank you for joining us. It's been great having you here.